Well, good morning, church. Happy May. Is that crazy? May is here. Who's ready for it? Not yet? No, not ready yet? Wish we could turn back time. Like share. Oh, is that a good song or what? No, it's not. All right. Luke chapter 18 is where we're going to be. Turn there if you would. Good to see you. Happy Sunday. Great to worship through song. Now we get to dive into God's word and worship together through his word. The word good is an interesting word. We can look around and uh, identify good people. Maybe we think we're good people. We definitely know good people around us, but good's a dangerous word. Good's a dangerous word because sometimes I think we can get lost in uh, a wrong definition of good. There was a study done recently. um, What makes a person good? And all these scientists, this is your tax money at work, just pay attention right now. All these scientists gathered and said, If we can identify one thing that makes a person good, what would it be? One action, one activity, one behavior, what makes a person good? And here's what they concluded. A person is good if after shopping they return their cart to the corral. No joke. They identified one activity out of everything in the world that makes a person good, and that is if you're the type of person that returns your shopping cart to the corral when you're done shopping. Who does that? Okay, good, 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 good. See, my philosophy is if I just leave it, then I actually help someone stay employed whose whose job it is to do that. You do? Or we're just lazy. (laughs) This is true. This is true. Don't get mad at me, okay? There, There you go. You got other things to focus on and do, right? So... But what is good? If Instead of leaving the idea of goodness up to scientists and uh, wh- what you do with your shopping cart, let's go a little deeper. Let's go a little deeper. Let's go to the Word of God, Luke 18. We have a familiar account in front of us with Jesus and two scenes this morning that we're going to look at. One scene involves children that are being brought to Jesus, and then right after this, a scene of a rich young ruler coming to Jesus. And I think Jesus is going to break down a lot in our, in our hearts and our minds today because what we need to do is less focus on us and more focus on God. Because as you're going to see, is it's God who defines what good is. And maybe we're not as good as we think we are. Maybe our actions are not as good as we think they are. And so we come to this account this morning and we look at this familiar passage of, of these children and this rich young ruler. And I think we're going to learn a lot through what Jesus has to say. So let's read the passage in its entirety, and then we'll go back, and I think I have four points I want us to to look at. Maybe five. Are there five this morning? Five. Oh, my goodness. Let's get started. All right. Verse 15 of Luke 18. So when they were bringing even their babies to him so that he might touch them, the disciples saw it, and they began rebuking these people. And Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. And a certain ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's an important question. Underline that question in your your Bibles. There's no more important question in life than that. And Jesus says to this rich young ruler, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus heard this and he says to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad and he, because he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they who heard it said, Then who can be saved? And he said, the things impossible with men are possible with God. Boy, underline that. That's a good verse right there. And Peter says, behold, we have left our homes and followed you, Jesus. 
And he says to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. May God write his truths upon our hearts this morning. So two scenes, they're, they're right here, just neck, neck and neck, children and the rich young ruler, right? And there's five things I want us to identify that will help us focus on God's character because what's at stake is eternal life. Notice the theme that runs through this is, is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God has come to us as we've looked at in Luke in previous weeks through the person and work of Jesus Christ. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is breaking through, but there's still people who are outside of the kingdom and they're asking the question, what do we need to do to inherit eternal life? And so we start with our first point is this, we need to understand the truth about God's acceptance. So notice the scene, verses 15, 16, 17, where people are bringing their children to, to Jesus and they're doing it so Jesus would bless them. Now, I'm going to tell you, majority of religious leaders in the world have never cared for children. Never cared for children. Why? Because children can't do anything for them. Jesus is different. Jesus turns the table. He's better than Muhammad. He's better than Buddha. He's better than Confucius. He, he, he's better than Oprah. All those famous religious leaders we have in the world. He's different because he actually uses children to model what is required to get into the kingdom. And it's not childishness, it's childlikeness. There's a difference. How many of us know childish people in our lives? Okay, don't look at your neighbor and, and with that weird snarky look. God requires childlikeness. What is a childlikeness? It's, it's like dependent. It's, it's humble. It's trusting. It's messy. It's, it's helpless. And so Jesus says something about these people who are bringing their children to Jesus. Another reason why the people brought the, the children to Jesus is for them to be, the children to be blessed. Did you know at this time, 50% of kids died before the age of 10 years old? So these people are like, we better get our kids to the rabbi so he can bless them because they may not survive. 60% were dead by 16. So in this culture where, again, children weren't valued, it went men, women, children. And these people wanted to get their children to Jesus so he could bless them. And yet, look who's stopping them. The disciples. As if they are like God's appointing instruments to keep certain riffraff out and, and allow other people in. So there's two things I want to I just tackle real quick when it comes to God's acceptance. Number one, we need to deal with those who approach Christ. And I'm going to let you know right now this morning, everyone is welcome to Jesus. And when I say everyone, it's just like the title of our message series. Luke is for everyone. There is, we have a God who shows no partiality. We have a God who is no respecter of persons, meaning he respects all people because all people are created in his image. How dare we stand in the way and consider who is not worthy of Jesus? Because I'm going to ask you, what makes you worthy of Jesus? And the moment you identify anything in and of yourself, you failed the test. Consider the unworthy, the unimportant, the, the inconvenient, the insignificant. Jesus is different because he sits there and goes, I want to welcome them to me. Especially these children because they, they model so much. See, in, in Jesus' culture, you know, a childhood was more desperate than cute, and we need to be that way too. I remember uh, reading about Mr. Rogers, right? Like, who's everyone's favorite, like, icon, right? When it comes to just gentleness and humility. And what I love about Mr. Rogers was it, was, it was known about Mr. Rogers that if you spent time with Mr. Rogers, he made you feel like you're the most important person in the world. Fred Rogers, ordained Presbyterian minister, that if you had one-on-one -on -one time with him, he made you feel like you're the most important person in the world. What can we learn from that? How dare we walk out into our world with these grudges and these biases and these, these prejudices and, and we deem people worthy to approach Christ and, or not to approach Christ? I'm going to tell you right now, everyone is welcome to Jesus. Did we not sing a song this morning, the, the, the uh, God so loved the world, that at the cross we all stand on level ground, no one is better than anybody else? And may we, we adopt the spirit of Mr. Rogers and say, for those who want to approach Jesus, we don't hinder them, but we help them. Because when you come in contact with Jesus, he'll make you feel like you're the most important person in the world. 
Can I get an amen from somebody? Boy, children are humble, they're trusting, they're dependent, they're helpless. Perhaps we can embody some of those, those qualities. But we also don't deal with just those who approach. We deal with those who have an attitude. And right now it's the disciples who have an attitude. Do we sometimes have attitudes? We do. And we think that we have been self-appointed as this filtering process of those who are allowed to get through to Jesus. Here's the disciples, right? They're preventing people from coming to Jesus. And this is not the only scene where they're preventing people coming to Jesus. They've done this before. This is kind of a track record for them. Remember, they wanted to send the, the crowd away hungry, but Jesus fed them, right? They tried to stop the Canaanite woman from asking Jesus to heal her daughter, but Jesus answered her prayer. So these guys, they just, they don't, they just love blocking people. He doesn't need you to block. He doesn't need you to tackle. He doesn't need you to defend him. Stop with preventing people from coming to know Christ. Because these disciples, probably like lots of religious teachers in the world, they block people. Why? Because we deem people insignificant. We deem people that they have nothing to offer. We deem people that they're just takers and not givers. They're liabilities and not assets, and we need to change our mentality. So Jesus says, be careful with who you think is welcome to come to Christ. Drop the attitude. If you're welcome, then I'll tell you what, that is the evidence of God's grace and mercy right there. Can you say amen? Here's what Jesus loves. Here's who Jesus loves. He delights in desperate widows. He delights in anguished tax collectors. He delights in insignificant children. He delights in messed up people like me. And this is a reminder for us that Jesus loves those who are valued little in society. Our Lord's habit was taking the marginalized and dignifying them. Taking those that were the pariahs and the outcasts of society and saying, you have value because it's those people that are symbolic of how great God's kingdom is. There's a reason why Luke puts this scene here right before the rich young ruler. So notice verses 5, 15, 16, 17. Why Luke puts this account right here before the rich young ruler, it's this. And I think this is the main gist of why the children were coming and why Luke highlights this. And it's this. A child doesn't mess with merit. A child doesn't care about status. A child doesn't care about how big your resume is, how fancy your car is, how well you've done academically, how well you've matured spiritually. A child doesn't care about those things. And Jesus says, adopt the same mindset. You know what you do when you mess with merit? You get messy. So take merit out of it and still get messy and come to know the God who blesses us in our messiness. I like the way that sounds. Blessing and messing. Who have lives right now that are in a mess? Let's be honest. God, God loves to work through that. God loves messy people. And I can think of children that are messy. Not mine. My kids, not messy. Your kids, yeah, they're super, super messy. Kids are messy. Kids are messy. And that's okay. Because God meets us in those places of messiness and blesses us. A Kentucky Derby winner yesterday. Medina Spirit. Long shot. You want to know why? Medina's spirit was not one of those horses that people looked at and go, winner. You know when Medina's spirit was first bought? Sold for a thousand bucks. This is the story, this is the kind of story movies are made out of. Medina's spirit was sold for a thousand bucks because they looked at the size of this horse and said, it will not amount to anything. Someone bought that horse for a thousand bucks, invested time, invested money into it, and guess what happened yesterday at the Kentucky Derby? It wins. Don't you dare count anyone out. Don't you dare count yourself out. What is impossible with people is more than possible with God. Is that not something that's coming up? That like, Yes. And so let us learn a lesson. Stop evaluating things by the externals and let's start thinking about the things that are internal where we all stand before the cross on level ground and we have a God who wants to show grace and mercy like you've never believed. So now we come to the rich young ruler. Point number two. We find this account in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And from each account, different eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus, we, we know he's rich, we know he's young, and we know he's a ruler. 
which is interesting because being rich, being young, being a ruler uh, are all three things that people strive for vigorously. Many of us, if not all of us, we want to be young, we want to have wealth, and we want to have power, right? Write those three, three, three things down because this is the embodiment of the three things that people clamor for today. Our culture values youth. Why? Because youthfulness speaks of vitality. It speaks of strength. It speaks of health. Our culture values wealth. Why? Because it affords us the ability to buy all the things we think are beneficial to us. And we value power because if you have power, you can control your environment and keep others from controlling us. Amen? And yet, Jesus is going to break down every one of those things as descriptive of this, of this unnamed man, right? He's rich, he's young, he's a ruler. He's young, which is interesting because where did he get his wealth? I'm going to tell you that he probably inherited his wealth. So this is not even wealth that he earned. Which you, when you have inherited wealth, it doesn't, be, it doesn't become valuable to you. It just becomes a tool to get you what you want. Pleasure, sex, drugs, roll, you know. And so he's rich. Why? Probably because he inherited money. He's young. He's like the, the aspiration of everyone in the culture. And he is a ruler, which means he has a dignified spot, probably because of his family, in the synagogue. So you look at this guy, and he's on the front of Jerusalem GQ. There he is, the rich young ruler. Ten steps to becoming young. Twenty steps to becoming wealthy. One step to having power, right? He's got the article. And yet he comes to Jesus. And I think his approach to Jesus was genuine. I think he was curious about something he was missing. And this is the way people are. If, if they have a subscribed to a path of merit-based religion or spirituality, there's always that inkling like there's something you're missing. So this guy, in order to cover his bases, went to Jesus. And notice how he approaches him. And this is the first point. Here's the truth about God's goodness. Look at verse 18. So the certain rich ruler questioned him, saying, good teacher. Now, it may seem like a polite address, uh, an, an appropriate ap approach. He says, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit et eternal life? Jesus then says, why do you call me good? Here's what I love about Jesus. He just, like, cuts to the chase. He, and he's really particular about words. Why do you call me good? See, Jesus knows something about this man that I don't think this man knows about himself. And that's the way Jesus operates in our lives. He knows a lot about us that we don't even know about ourselves. So he stops the, the, the rule, rich young ruler and says, why do you call me good? Because by asking that question, he's building upon the approach of this man, and he wants him to stop and consider who he's approaching. Jesus is not denying his deity here. He's actually forcing the, the ruler to think about what he just said. Because what does Jesus say? No one is good except God alone. Circle that verse. There is no goodness apart from Christ. There is none good, no, not one, Romans chapter 3. We all fall short of the glory of God. He is good. If you want to know what good is, he is the standard. C.S. Lewis said, if you want to know what a, a crooked stick looks like, put it right up to a straight stick. God's the straight stick. He defines good. Why? Because his character is good. It's, it's all over the Bible. Taste and see that the Lord is? Yes. The Old Testament is replete with this idea of God's goodness. So what Jesus does is he pushes back lovingly on this rich young ruler, and he says, why do you call me good? Because by approaching me, you're acknowledging something about me. And this is the big question, who is Jesus? He is who he said he is. He's God. Write down that question, who is Jesus? He's forcing this man to come to terms. And you did not call rabbis good. This was not cultural. This, you can study Old Testament, New Testament history. You did not approach a rabbi and call them good. They reserved that word for God alone. So this man is acknowledging something, that Jesus is different but is he ready to cross that line to say he's God? You're going to find out that there's too much at stake for him to make that decision. So we must be clear who Jesus is. 
This, this man is being forced to now reflect upon his approach with Christ. And, and Jesus wants him to make the connection because if you do not answer this foundational question, who is Jesus, you will get every other question in life wrong. This, this is the goodness of God. He provides the path. And if you do miss out on the path, you're lost. And so Jesus says, let's talk about who's good. Who is Jesus? Then we go into the second point. So now that he's got him kind of thinking about this, let's talk about God's commandments. So this man says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That word do, again, like good, it's a dangerous word. Because there's really nothing that you can do. It's already done. Can you write those two words down? There's a huge difference between, it, you, two letters makes a huge difference. Do versus done. The world is filled with people who want to do things for eternal life. That is a never-ending downward spiral. You come to Jesus about who he is, the work is done. This is why on the cross he says it is finished. What's finished? Works-based righteousness. Merit-based living. Thinking that you can do and do and do and earn God's approval. And Jesus says that's like trying to survive in quicksand and moving feverishly. It's not going to happen. And so now they start talking about God's commandments because notice who starts the topic about God's commandments. It's Jesus. So Jesus, again, being so keen on a person's soul, he zeroes in on what this man truly needs to deal with. Check this out. Verse 20, you know the commandments. So he's affirming something that the rich young ruler is very familiar with. That's the commandments of God, 10 commandments, right? Found in Exodus chapter 20. But notice Jesus zeroes in on five commandments. Notice verse 20. He says, you know the commandments, right? Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And the guy responds and says, nailed them. Been there, done that. That's his mentality. But wait, there's only five commandments that Jesus mentions. How many more are there that Jesus doesn't mention? Five. Let's see. Ten minus five. I went to public school, so I'm doing okay. There's five left. Now, notice Jesus is intentional in what he leaves out. The five that he mentions in verse 20 are all external. They're all outwardly observable. And the rich young ruler is probably feeling pretty good about himself. He's like, checked it, checked it, checked it, checked it, checked it. I got it. All those I've obeyed, and even from my youth, I've, I've been good in those areas. But the law, the commandments, are the things that God requires of us. And they were never given to us to serve as a checklist. Like, I hope you don't have on your fridge at home the Ten Commandments, and every day you go, did that, did that, did that, did that, did that. Here's the thing, is the law was given to show us that they're impossible to fulfill apart from God. Matter of fact, they were never given for you to fulfill. You don't go home and, and, and treat the commandments as, as a checklist like, how did I do today? Failed in three, succeeded in seven one day, achieved nine, failed in one the next, wreck, wrecked my life because I didn't obey any of them the next day. That's not what God wants us to do. See, you need to know something about the truth of God's commandments is that while we are called to keep the law, God knows that we would never be able to keep the law. They're a mirror to show us how far we fall short and to bring us to dependency because you know what childlikeness involves? Helplessness. Dependency. I'm going to tell you one thing. The, the rich young ruler, he was wealthy morally and he was wealthy materially but he was poor spiritually and i want you to know something you can be morally wealthy and spiritually impoverished you can be materially wealthy and spiritually impoverished the spiritual part is what god cares for the most he is not a moral police officer Who's, who's going who's gonna to cite you for not keeping this commandment and, and reward you for keeping that one. And we don't perceive God as that. 
We come to God and say, I'm morally bankrupt and I'm materially dependent on things I shouldn't be materially dependent on, but spiritually is the place where I need you to make me rich, God. This is what Jesus is confronting him with. He had material wealth, but he wasn't material, and he, wasn't, and he had moral wealth, but he wasn't spiritually rich. Here's what's scary, you guys. You may want to write this down. It, it might be too big for you to write down, but just listen. How tragic it is for us to know God's commandments and yet not know us. Do you understand? You can know God's commandments and not know your own heart. And this is what tr- Jesus is always getting at throughout the, the Gospels, whether we're talking Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, he is getting at the heart because the law makes us all equals, all equally condemned without distinction. And so Jesus shows the law and says, you don't measure up. Galatians chapter 3, here's what Paul says in, in verses 21 22. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Are they opposed to one another? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But because that is impossible, the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus, might be given to those who believe. What's the key to true liberty and freedom? Jesus. Faith in Christ. Because did not Christ come to say, I have not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. And there's not a jot or a tittle, a crossing of the T, a dotting of the I, that will not go unchecked. All the promises of God are yes and amen in him. And all God's people said, you better believe it. See, this man excelled in the second part of the law. He excelled in five, six, seven, eight, nine. But notice where he failed the first half. The second half of the law had to do with our social obligations to one another. The first half of the, lo- half of the law has to do with our relationship to God. He excelled in his social relationships. He was horrible in his relationship with the Almighty. But I want you to notice something too. What else that he missed out on and Jesus didn't cite? Commandment number 10. You shall not covet. Write that down. Covet. C-O-V-E-T. Because here's what Jesus masterfully does in encountering this rich young ruler. He bookends a quick journey to this man's heart. Commandment number 10, you shall not covet. This is the man's problem. He loves his wealth more than he loves God. He brings that right back to verse, uh, the first commandment and the second commandment. What's the first commandment say? You shall not have any other gods before me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? Singularity in focus. Singularity in devotion. Second commandment says what? Don't have any idols. What happens when you don't honor the Lord and, and have him first? You start substituting things for God. God is masterful in what he gave the commandments. Right? Commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. And commandment number two, don't worship false idols. So Jesus is now going to zero in on his heart. Jesus left out the last one intentionally because this is the point of entry. He's rich, and his wealth has become his God. Can I tell you, sometimes sometimes our approach with people is okay to have law first and then follow up with grace. Law first, grace second. Write that down. People need to understand the law. Why? Because they need to know how far they fall short. But you have to follow law with grace. If it's all law and no grace, we're left despairing and we're no good uh, just wallowing in our sin. Grace lifts us out, right? Grace lifts us out. You need to have the law. The law is clear, but he's completely missing the essential parts of the law and merely focusing on the external stuff. And what Jesus masterfully does, once again, is he deals with the unseen areas of our lives. Which brings us to point number two, the truth about God's priorities. And I'm going to have you write down one word when it comes to God's priority, relationship. 
Everything that's given in Old and New Testament is about relationship with God. Everything that's given to us through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation is about relationship with him. Here's what God doesn't want you to prioritize. Your doing over your being. Here's one thing God doesn't want you to get out of order is that you have to uh, work and do and work and do to earn God's approval. God wants you to come to a place where in Christ you're already approved and therefore you live a life reflecting that grace and mercy that's shown to you. Let me just tell you, there's less headache and heartache on that journey. See, here's what God prioritizes, relationship. And this is the thing that this man, this rich young ruler, is missing out on. He is missing out on the fact that all of our problems are ultimately solved in Christ Jesus. Look what Jesus says in verse 22, and I want you to underline these five haunting words. One thing you still lack. Underline that. Because this is why the man came. Like, hey, you know what? I think I got my life pretty, pretty covered. Um, Jesus, how am I doing? They're interacting. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, but there's one thing you still lack. Like, you know, you're, you're at home, right, and you're doing chores. I see this in my household, right? And the kids are like, oh, did we do all the chores that mom and dad wanted? Nope, there's one thing left. So there's a sense that the hope rises because they go, we're almost done. Right? There's one thing. If, if your boss came to you and said, you're doing a great job, but there's one thing I need you to do, you're, you're zooming in because you want to have that performance review. You want to, to get that promotion. You want to do something, right? So when you hear one thing, the hope in us rises, and we go, one thing, I can do this. There's one thing you still lack. And so you can see the wheel starting to turn in this rich young ruler's mind. What is that one thing? What is that one thing? And here's what Jesus says. Follow me. Now, granted, there's stuff in between. But, but notice what Jesus is ultimately getting to. Yes, it's about selling possessions. Yes, it's about blessing the poor. But just because you become a generous person doesn't mean you're in with God. Right? The, the, the abundance of wealth doesn't mean you're out, and the lack of wealth doesn't mean you're in, because there's people who have lack of wealth who still have idols in their hearts. Notice what Jesus says. One thing you still lack, dot, 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 me. And the man grieves. There's no rebuttal. There's no response. There's no debate. It says, and the man was sad. It goes beyond sad. He was grieved. You want to know why? He loved his stuff more than he loved Jesus. The stuff that he owned in reality owned him. I tell you what, you can live a life lacking so much stuff, but the one thing we can't afford to lack is, is, is Jesus. I don't want anyone leaving this place today lacking Christ. You may lack health, and I, and I, and I feel for you. You may lack a job, and you may lack relationships and friendships. You may lack a decent car. You may lack a good sports team. You may lack whatever. Those things you can survive without. As hard as they may be, but there's one thing you cannot live without. Jesus. Because again, he's not looking for your generous spirit as if that one thing is that act. Oh, if I just give away all that I have to the poor, I'm good. No, no, no. If you do it with improper motors, motives, you're still worse off than you were at the very beginning. There's one thing you still lack me stop treasuring other things because all of us and whether it's money and whether it's sex or whether it's streaming and podcasts whether it's technology i don't know what it is but there's something in our hearts that has taken first place and here's what god says do the radical thing and get rid of what's standing in the way of making god number one and you're sitting there going, that's impossible. And then Jesus says, well, what's impossible with man is not impossible with God. Don't we forget about that? Don't we forget about Romans 1, 16? 
For salvation is the power of God to all those who believe. Your salvation is not fact-based. It is not truth-based. Ultimately, it is the power of God-based exploding and blowing up hearts that were once idol factories who are now set to say, I'm going to treasure Jesus and treasure Jesus alone. Is that not the power of God? Is not eternal life believing in the one whom God has sent? John chapter 17, verse 3. Don't miss this. Jesus makes it real simple. This is eternal life. Okay, now we're all paying attention. Ears perked, hearts open, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He is the door. He is the way. He is the life. He's the path. He's the all in all. He is the treasure, capital T, and no other treasure would ever amount to the value of who he is. Adore him. Worship him. Honor him. Live for him. Because life is not found apart from him. You know, you can have John 3, 16, and that's a great verse. This one trumps it. This one trumps it. For God so loved the world, we know that, and we know it ad nauseum. But do you know this, that you are called to know, that is a word of intimacy, that is a word of relationship. I'm so glad John didn't say that you do these things and then list all the stuff you have to do. Personal knowledge of God through the Son, Jesus Christ, is eternal life. So I'm hanging out with my dad this week. He has uh, got early cognitive memory loss going on. He's 74. One of those guys that you sit there and go, he knows everything. He was the guy you want on your Trivial Pursuit team. He's the guy that goes to these sorts of trivia things at bars, and they're like, we want Ron on our team. We've noticed recently he hasn't been as sharp as he used to be. And a few months ago, he was diagnosed with early onset, onset memory loss, perhaps Alzheimer's leading to that. Early stages, praise God, we don't know how quickly, how slow this is going to accelerate. So me and my siblings, there's, there's four of us. Let's spend time. Let's engage my dad. My dad and I, we talk about music, we talk about movies, we talk about sports, we, get to, we talk about a whole host of things. So I'm the oldest. So there's a, there's a connection there with my dad. I was there with him. As a 15-year-old journeying with my mom died of, of, of glioblastoma, brain cancer. My dad have always, and I have always shared a love for music. My dad's 74 years old. He listens to Tool. He listens to Mastodon. He listens to System of a Down. My dad's cool. He's the one that took me to my first ACDC concerts and let me run across the field to go touch Angus Young's leg. That was my dad. The original Compton Terrace at Legend City, that's where that happened, 1982, 12 years old. Touching Angus Hung's leg. I still haven't washed this hand. <laughs> so I took my dad out to lunch. And we spent the first 30 minutes talking about Jesus. So my dad and mom became believers early on in their lives. And um, early on, I mean, when I was a teenager, I saw my mom and dad start loving Jesus. I'm like, what's going on? Like, that's weird. My God was ACDC, not Jesus Christ, right? They, they come to know Jesus, right? My mom dies. My dad goes into a spiritual tailspin. And we as siblings, m me and my brother, sister, my brother, sister, have always asked, like, where's dad at with Jesus? Where's dad at with Jesus? So I got one-on-one -on -one time with my dad this week. And, you know, the older people get, the more you kind of want to make things certain. So I'm talking to my dad. And he, and he leads out with, you know, I hope I'm, I'm making good choices for God to, to love me. And I'm like, all right, let's stop right there. Let's stop right there. Dad, here's the good news. You don't have to make choices for God to love you in your life. You just need to come to a place where you accept his grace and his mercy in Jesus. And you can tell the wheels were spinning. And then he says, but I've got so many dues I owe. I, I said, Dad, stop right there. So, you know, nothing like having an oldest child as a, as a theologian, as a pastor. But he needed to hear these things. He's gr he has embraced this workspace righteousness. And I said, Dad, the reason God loves us 
is not for us to hopefully, you know, gain approval through our, our activities, our behaviors. You are already approved by God in Christ, and now you live a life that reflects that grace you've received. And he started tearing up. He started tearing up. He's like, boy. He goes, I need to hear that. I said, Dad, don't we all? I'll never get tired of preaching that message. I said, I, I yell at my church every Sunday about these things. It's a spiritual gift, yelling at the, at the church. But isn't it true? There are people who are sabotaging their souls because they don't think they've done enough. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the message that brings freedom and liberty. It's not what you do, it's what's already been done. You point to the cross. It's not how well you measure up, because guess what? We're all going to fail in measuring up. But it's knowing that even in my messiness, God's grace and mercy is still extended to me, and I'm still His. You can never mess yourself up outside the grace and will of God. Let me say it another way. You can never sin so much where you're outside of God's good grace. Romans 5.20. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. That doesn't mean you look for deliberate ways to sin, but you come into, into God's presence and say, boy, I'm a mess, help. For salvation is the power of God at work in us to will and want his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2, 2 and 13, right? You work out your salvation with fear and trembling for his will because it is his power at work within you you can't do this on your own rich young ruler you're not wise enough you're not rich enough you're not young enough you're not powerful enough to do this on your own you need God and you need to treasure him more than you treasure anything else let's be honest in all of our hearts it's a first commandment problem every time who's got a first commandment problem going on Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that is a battle that you and I will face every single day. But by God's grace and his strength, what's impossible for us is possible with him. Pray for my dad. Because I don't want my dad's hands to be overburdened with stuff that he's not meant to carry. I want his hands to be empty and his heart to be full. And I want you to leave here hands empty, hearts full. He's carried your sin. He's carried your unrighteousness. He's carried all the things that are strikes against you before a holy God, but praise God that he comes to us and dwells in us fully, full of his grace and truth now within us. Wow. Wow. I don't want you to be the type of people who are like Gollum. You remember Gollum from Lord of the Rings? Here's the problem with Gollum. Like, my precious! He's treasuring things that don't give him life. He's treasuring precious things that are ultimately causing death in him. People are sad over what has control over them, but they love them too much that they don't know what satisfaction apart from them is like. This rich young ruler is not a happy camper. He's grieving. And here's what I love. Jesus doesn't pamper him in his, in his grief. Can I just tell you how sometimes we need to celebrate the insensitivity of Christ? He doesn't be like, oh, no, 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 don't go away, sad. Here, come on back. Let me backpedal. Let me soften the message. Oh, I made you upset? Like, Jesus is, like, totally insensitive, and he's all right with being insensitive. Because you know why? Idols are not to be messed with. They're to be destroyed. Do you hear me? You don't play around as if it's a pet. The thing that is diverting your attention from adoring Christ is destroying you. And you know what Jesus doesn't do? He doesn't come along and go, oh, it's okay. Let's just pamper this thing and just feed it and just take it for walks and, and treat it like a household pet. No, no, you kill it. And Jesus doesn't chase this guy because he understands the severity of the issue. Did not Jesus say, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Can I just ask you, is that radical? Now, figure, now this is figurative. Don't go like, okay, pastor said to go pluck my eye out. 
Everyone comes to church next week, like wearing eye patches. Oh, yeah, pirate church. That's what we're going to call this, right? The reality of it is, unless we get radical and intense with the things that are not allowing us to adore God as the treasure and we're treasuring other stuff, you need to get radical. What is it God saying to sever from your life? What is God saying to pluck out of your, your eye? To radically exterminate from your heart. Get severe. Because here's what you're not going to come in contact with. is a God who's going to pamper you in your sin. Deal with it. Because here's the good news. <laughs> Boy. When you realize that thing that you thought was going to give you life doesn't, and you radically get rid of it and come to him who truly is life, you're going to sit there and go, why didn't I do this sooner? Today's the day of salvation, you guys. Get radical with God. Because his omnipotence overwhelms every impossibility in our lives. Look at verse 24, 25. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? So Jesus doesn't pamper, and, he's, and he put, it's almost like he puts salt, more salt into this guy's grieving. And this is not figurative. This is literally, like the, the camel's the largest animal in Palestine, and the eye of the needle is so tiny. And Jesus says, yes, it's a humorous illustration to convey an incredibly impossible thing. But what you think is impossible is more than possible with God. Is not God powerful enough to change the heart of my dad, your friends, you? <laughs> and is he not powerful enough to bring you from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beautiful light? Is he powerful enough to do that? Okay. Surrender. Surrender. Look at what Jesus promises. Look at verse 28, 29, the last point, the truth about God's reward. Because here's the disciples, right? These guys don't get it. Don't you identify with the disciples sometimes? Right? Like at one point they're hindering people from coming to know Jesus as if they're Jesus' bodyguards. Like you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. And then Peter chimes up and goes, hey, Jesus, we left our houses and we gave up everything for you. As if good, Jesus is like, come here, big boy, I got a reward for you. Let me pin this little beautiful blue ribbon on you and be like, look, Peter, look at Peter. I, no. Look at this. Verse 28, 29. Then who can be saved, right? They heard this, who can be saved? And, 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 and Jesus says, all things are possible with men, impossible with men are not, are possible with God. Peter says, behold, we left our homes and followed you. And he says, truly I say to you. There is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom who shall not receive. And then Matthew, Mark talk about a hundredfold what you've sacrificed. I'm going to tell you right now, the rich young ruler walked away unchanged. This guy's a bad businessman. Because if I came to you with an offer to make a hundred times your invest investment, Tim Bike, you're good with numbers. Is that, is that a good investment? Yes. Lord assures his disciples that no one making any sort of radical sacrifice will go unrewarded. Can I tell you right now, the thing that God says for you to part with so that you have him, you want not a treasure, you want the treasure, Christ. You want to, to praise him, and in order to praise him, you have to prize him, and if you, you want to prize him, you've got to want him more than you want anything else. And can I tell you right now that every sacrifice you make for Jesus will be a, a smart sacrifice because to have him is the goal. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Whatever gain I had, however, however much I made, however, my, however good my spiritual resume looks, I count it all as loss for the sake of Christ. Are you ready to say what Paul says and that you count everything as loss for the sake of having him? Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Boy, I want that. I want that spirit within me. I'm praying for that spirit within you. That you want him more than you want anything else. This rich young ruler becomes a warning to all people who want a Christian faith that does not change their values or upset their lifestyle. 
I'm going to tell you right now. God is going to demand radical things from you. And this is where people turn away. Right? Like, Jesus, you had me at honoring father and mother. You had me at not murdering. Like, we could all do that, right? Not murder. Let's just, okay, you're scaring me now. We can, can we make a vow not to murder? Like, we can all do this. But the moment God starts making some severe demands on us is the moment we walk away. And I'm going to tell you guys, and, 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 and we, we can't sugarcoat this, Jesus will always demand more from you than you ever imagined, yet he will always give you more than you've ever dreamed. I have found this to be true 36 year old, years in Christ. He will demand from me more than I ever imagined, yet he always promises to give me more than I have ever dreamed. God is, someone once said, God is not only more demanding than people cared to think, he's also more generous than they dared hope. And can I just, I'm going to ask you to, to eliminate a word from your vocabulary. Don't eliminate it entirely. Unlimited. Sacrifice. Write that word down, sacrifice. Can I just tell you right now, you don't make sacrifices. There's one sacrifice that's been made. And that's Jesus on the cross who was rich yet became poor for your sake so that through his poverty you might be made rich. Hallelujah! Compared to that, are you truly making a sacrifice? Okay, get rid of that word. There's one sacrifice, Jesus. You make decisions to treasure him now. It's an exchange of treasure. I'm going to treasure this that I thought was valuable for him who is more than valuable. You're not making, you're not making sacrifices. It's a joy to get rid of everything. Matthew 13, verse 44, the shortest parable in the Bible Man's, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field that a man discovers. He goes, he sells all that he has with joy and goes and buys that field. There's no like, oh, I'm losing it. No, he's like, I'm excited to get rid of everything to have Jesus. Are you? Last week, Oscars won. I love movies. I've been catching up on a lot of movies lately. Best picture, Nomadland. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. Best movie of the year. I picked it months ago. Who's seen it? That's what I thought. Two people. Here's my question. How many people watch the Oscars? That's what I thought. <laughs> I think, I think the, the survey was three people in the United States watched the Oscars last week. Stupid, right? I, was one, I didn't watch it. We talked about it end times. Remember that? See what I did? I sacrificed, bro. <laughs> so Nomad, when, if you haven't seen Nomad, Land, watch it. You know, it's, it's an R-rated film. And you know why it's R-rated? Because it shows a woman naked swimming in a river for like three seconds. It is a beautiful movie directed by a Chinese female director who did a movie a couple years ago called The Writer. If you haven't seen The Writer, watch The Writer. Hansen's awesome. Break, you're like tearing up, you're crying, you're broken. She does this movie, The Writer. She does this movie, Nomadland, wins best movie of the year. Frances McDormand wins actress. Chloe Zhao wins director. And you know what the movie's about? Exactly what we're talking about. What does it mean to give up on just living for stuff? And discover what life's all about. Now Jesus isn't part of the movie. But I'm going to tell you what. It speaks. To a world that is striving for stuff. And clamoring for position. And thinking that we find our identity through what we own. The movie is about how much we can get rid of. And ultimately discover what, what's important in life. And that is relationships. Watch the movie. It's a slow movie. I'm not going to lie to you. You guys are going to be like, Pastor Scott rec recommended this. We're Spy Kids 5. Like, give us something good, Pastor. But I love No Man Land because of the simplicity and a reminder that you don't need stuff to define you as a person. I'm thankful that the Bible is right in line with that. I should say that's right in line with the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, Make the greatest investment anyone in this world can make. Surrender it all for Christ, and he'll reward you. You'll stand before him and go, why did I give away more? Why did I sacrifice more? A hundredfold investment to make Christ your treasure? Are you kidding me? But the reward is ours already. That you have experienced the grace of God.
How many of you could die today and you're still happy? <laughs> How many of you could die today and just be content because you're loved by God? Boy, Christ, may he be your treasure more than anything else. And all God's people said, you know it. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for today, a beautiful morning to be together, beautiful morning to lift our voices and praise to you through the songs and, and our interaction with one another. Thank you for bringing our, our hearts in alignment with your word. Lord, illuminate your scriptures before us. May there be seeds that have been planted. May we look at our lives and just do honest evaluation before you. And, and Lord, while we are probably thinking like the, the disciples Things you're demanding of us are impossible. Remind us, Father, that with us, yes, it is impossible. But with you, things are more than possible. Search us. Dig deep within our spirits. Show us the things that we are treasuring more than we treasure Jesus. Help us to make joyful eliminations from our lives. And may it be our prayer that each and every day we want Jesus more than we want anything else. Thank you for loving us, for showing us such magnificent grace, extending us such wonderful mercy, and giving us truly liberating forgiveness. We pray this all in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day.